Well, welcome everybody to our last installment of the Manufacturers Webinar Series. Um, I'm Mark Dykes. I'm the coordinator for the University of Maryland B Squad. Um, what we have done is put together a really awesome series, or at least I think it is, of we've invited all of the manufacturers of the various miticides um, and other products for the, the hives. And we've invited them to come on and talk about their products and have a Q&A at the end. The idea here being is that we get a lot of questions about different mite treatments, about mite products. And so my thought is, is why don't you hear it from the people that uh, created these products, the people that market these products. And so that's where this series came up from. Um, let me advance slides here. So like I said earlier, this will be recorded. We are legally obliged to say that. So if you are not comfortable being on this recording, please log off now. And like I said before, it will be available on our YouTube page. Um, we'll post that link to Facebook, but it's also, like I said, on YouTube. Um, just to lay a little groundwork here, we do not directly endorse any of the products that are featured in this webinar. Um, also, any of the recommendations made by the University of Maryland B Squad as to specific products uses are made by our scientific findings and are not influenced by the manufacturers. And then finally, UMB B Squad was not paid or, re or compensated in any way by the manufacturers to put on this webinar. This is surely an informational webinar. Um, our, our sincere goal is to allow you guys to have a really great beekeeping year and to make you as best beekeepers as you can. And the, the way we want you to do that is by being the most educated beekeepers that you can. And that's exactly what we're here to do. We're here to talk about the different products, um, learn uh, little things here and there. I know I've learned a lot from this series already. And so with that, um, I do want to let you know that right now we are currently soliciting donations for the UMD B Squad. If you're obliged to do that, please contact us and we'll um, let you know how to do that. Um, everything we do here is grant funded. And so we really want to provide you guys the best uh, bang for your buck. And every dime that goes into our pro or every, every dime that's donated goes directly into our program. Um, I also want to make you aware, uh, aware of some resources that are available online for free. Uh, the Honeybee Health Coalition has put together a number of very good, um, well-vetted resources. Um, most of the manufacturers that we've had on our webinar series have been a part of this. So we have direct access from that. But in, in addition to that, it's been well-vetted by um, a majority of the bee scientists throughout the United States and Canada. So there's a lot of really good information in these um, different resources from the Honeybee Health Coalition. And so with that, I want to introduce our speaker, uh, Tom Nolan. Uh, Tom has been with Nod for a number of years, um, keeping bees for about 10 years now. Uh, I met Tom in the swamps of Florida years and years ago. We were looking at um, some of the uh, products that they were developing at that time. Um, Tom is based up in Canada. He is the North America and uh, New Zealand sales rep. I'd really love to be on one of those New Zealand trips, Tom. If you ever need a, a, a somebody to carry your luggage, I'll be happy to do that for you. Um, and so with that, Tom, I'll let you take it away. Let me quit sharing my screen here and you can take over and welcome to our webinar. And thank you so much for joining us this evening. Great, Mark. <clears throat> thank you very much. And I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to uh, to come and present our products this evening. Um, give me a second here while I get my, my screen up there. So you can see my screen, Mark. Everything looks good. Everything's good. Okay, yeah, so um, thanks again for the opportunity to uh, come tonight and uh, thanks everybody for attending. Uh, like Mark said, I am a North American sales rep for Not Apri Products. And I also to look after New Zealand. I'm a small scale hobbyist beekeeper myself. I keep about 30 colonies. I live in the city, so I guess I'm an urban beekeeper. I keep about, uh, yeah, 30 colonies, uh, two locations, University of Toronto uh, downtown campus and University of Toronto suburban campus. And I keep some on a farm on the edge of the city out by the Toronto Zoo. So uh, 30 colonies is, is plenty for somebody who's got a full-time job. So this, this evening, I'm going to sort of uh, introduce a little, little bit, tell you a little bit about Nod, who we are, um, how we came to be, and introduce you to our products. Some of you may already be using our products, and some of you may be new to our products. And hopefully by the end of this evening, you'll be more familiar and we'll be able to answer some questions. And, uh, and if not, you could always reach us uh, anytime. 
so okay why is my so not apri products is a canadian company it was founded in 1997 so we're just coming up on a milestone for us next year it'll be 25 years uh, Nod was founded by beekeepers for beekeepers when they're presented with the challenge of Varroa coming in and sort of devastating the colonies in Canada. Uh, the founders of Nod were looking at different active ingredients. Um, the ingredient they settled on, of course, was formic acid. Uh, they chose formic acid because they believed it was a, uh, it could be developed into a practical, sustainable miticide uh, for the beekeeping industry also a product that would not uh, harm the image of honey as being a whole wholesome food product as formic acid does not leave any, um, any residue in the honey, the wax or the hive products. Um, so that was our challenge. We had a good active ingredient. We had to develop a um, delivery mechanism for that formic acid. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, our, um, our Mighty Way Quick Strips and our Formic Pro. Presently, our global reach nod, we're um, in 27 countries, Canada, US, Europe, and New Zealand. We, um, our main product in, whoops, not sure what why that happened. Our main product in Europe is Mighty Way Quick Strips, which is branded in Europe as, as Max Beehive Strips. We have just gone through the regulatory process for Formic Pro, so the European marketplace will soon have Formic Pro available to them also. Uh, by the way, Crucian, so we don't sell direct to the beekeepers. We do. Um, and we lost you there for just a second. Am I back? Yes, you're back. Um, you were talking about the uh, registrations over in, in Europe. In Europe. Yeah. So we're, we're basically in 27 countries. We, um, well, in Europe, the product uh, that we were selling in Europe is our Mighty Way Quick Strips. In Europe, it's known as Max Beehive Strips. We have just gone through the regulatory process and uh, will now be selling Formic Pro throughout Europe. In total, so for a total of 27 countries worldwide. Um, tonight, I'm really going to be focusing on the products that we sell in, in North America in the U.S., which is our uh, Mighty Way Quick Strips, our former Pro, and our Bee Cozies. Um, like I was saying, we, um, we do not sell direct to beekeepers. We sell through distribution through all the, uh, all the main beekeeping supply stores carry our product, but we do support beekeepers. So anyone can reach out to us anytime. We have a full support team, which I'll introduce to you now. Um, we... Uh, we're always there to answer um, customer service questions for people who have used our products, for people who are thinking about using our product. Uh, many of you will know Kathleen Ireland. She was our, our marketing manager. She's now moved on to be our director of sales and marketing. So she's going to be really focusing on the European marketplace and still overseeing North America. You will all, for anyone who's ever been to any of the trade shows or conferences will have met Kathleen or spoken to her on the phone. She's been pretty much our primary customer contact for the last 10 years. Uh, we have a new marketing manager, Laura Wagden. We're really excited to have her. She's filling in Kathleen's shoes. Uh, Christy Mickeljones, our marketing coordinator and our customer service rep. So anyone's ever called with a customer service question has um, definitely spoke to Christy. And we're really excited to have Heather Bell joining us. Uh, she'll be joining us full-time in April as our new full-time honeybee researcher. So we're, so we're going to be excited to have Heather. The, like I said, the products we sell in the United States, we have three products. We sell Formic Pro, Mighty Way Quick Strips, and our Bee Cozy Winter Hive Wraps. The good focus of, of the talk tonight is going to be about our, uh, our Formic uh, Acid products, our Varroa Control products. Before we really get into the products, we're going to hit you with a little bit of sort of... Um, Chinese, ancient Chinese philosophy from the art of war, from the general Sun Tzu, who basically said, if you don't know your enemy, you're not going to win the battle. And Varroa is a result of uh, ongoing battles. So we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, about the life cycle of the Varroa mite. We, um, 
normally at this point I'd, I'd play a video we have. We have a great video. Anyone who hasn't seen it, I would really recommend you have a look at our website at nodglobal.com. The video of the life cycle of Roma really you know, expl explains a lot about the biology and the life cycle of this pest. Um, I didn't want to play the video tonight because we tend to get a lot of technical snags with the Zoom meetings. And uh, so I just give a little uh, NGIF from the uh, video here. But as you can see, um, the, varroa, the varroa mite um, hitches a ride on the adult bees. Um, it goes into the cell just before the, the cell is about the, to be capped. The varroa mite reproduces underneath the, underneath the um, cap cell. First egg she'll lay will be a male egg. They'll reproduce and they're off to the races, reproducing fairly rapidly. The other key part to know about the life cycle of varroa mite is that because they're reproducing under your cap brood, they're growing just as your hive is growing. So by midsummer, when you've got you know full frames of, of cap brood and your hives are at their strongest, that's most likely when your varroa mites are going to be at their strongest. So understanding this life cycle really gives you a good idea of when to treat and how to treat, whether you're using our products or any other products. If you, um, if you don't understand the life cycle of Romite, you could be using the wrong product at the wrong time or the right product, which is not at the right, right time. So again, it's, um, if, you, if you can, it's really worth checking out, checking out this video. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that more um, a little bit later. So what makes our rural control products unique? Um, the, main, the main feature of, um, of both our Mitoate Quick Strips and our Formic Pro is that we target the mites below the brood cap. So we're not just killing mites on the adult bees, the phoretic mites or the mites that are in the dis dispersal phase, as we say now. We're also penetrating that brood cap, killing the mites underneath where they reproduce. And that's very important, which makes this product very different than auxilic acid, which is only basically killing the phoretic mites, the mites that are on the adult bees in the um, dispersal phase. The other main feature is this is an organic acid with no known resistance. Um, people have been using formic acid for what we've been using here in Canada for 25 years, and there's been no signs of any type of documented resistance. And I doubt we're going to see any resistance, although you should never say never. Um, we're quite confident that we're not going to see resistance to the formic acid. The um, other main feature of our product is that it is safe to use these products during the honey flow while your supers are on. And that's, that's important. The, um, the recent advent of, of um, oxalic acid, um, many people are using that product during the brood period, but you know, I always want to, particularly for the new beekeepers, many people here, formic acid, oxalic acid, they think it's the same thing, very different products. Um, this product will penetrate the cap, kill mites below the cap. That will not happen with, um, with oxalic acid. So the reason why we, why the founders chose formic acid is we were able to make a formulated product that's quick, easy, and one application. So you're not having to do multiple ap applications. Our products come in various sizes. We have them in two packs for the hobbyists, 10 packs for sideliners, and we have 30 dose commercial pails for the, um, for the, for the commercial beekeepers. They, um, both from Mighty Way Crixus and Formic Pro are packaged this way. Like I said earlier, our products are pretty much available in any, any all the major retail uh, beekeeping stores carry our products. So let's get into the nitty gritty. What does it look like? The, the formic acid is, our delivery mechanism is a polysaccharide gel. So it's a formulated gel pad that's impregnated with the formic acid. It's wrapped in a white paper, which we call an eco, it's a slow release eco wick paper. We always have to tell people not to remove this paper. It's not packaging. The, 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 the strips are inside a sachet. That sachet is a mylar foil type fashion. That, that's the packaging. But once you open up and you see that white paper, it's not meant to come off. 
it really it is a real integral part of the, of the product. It's what slows down the release and makes, in case of Mighty Way Quick Strips, it makes it release over a seven day period. With the um, Formic Pro, it's going to release over a 14 day period. If you were to take that white paper off, we lose the slow release technology and what you get is a big hard blast and it's going to be too much and it can be hard on the bees and you can have um, you can have bee mortality. So you definitely don't want to re remove the uh, remove that paper. For anybody who has used the Mitoway quick strips, you'll know that the strips actually look uh, white as opposed to the sort of darker brown strips. The, the Mitoway quick strips was our sort of a previous generation product before, before the Formic Pro. The main reason why we brought out the Formic Pro is we had um, two challenges with the Mitoway quick strip. And a lot of these challenges were really more for our resellers and our large commercial customers. The, the Mighty Way Quick Sips or the Max had a 12 month shelf life, but it was also temperature sensitive when it was stored. It needed to be stored uh, below 25 degrees Celsius. The, um, so if it was stored too hot, it would get soft, it would get gooey, it would break down and we'd lose a little bit of the slow release technology. So stored properly and you know before the expiry date, the product was fine. But if it was stored too hot or used beyond the expiry date, you could actually get um, we the the slow release technology would break down. You would get a blast, be hard. So our answer to that was to develop our our second product, our our Formic Pro. You can see the Formic Pro looks a little darker. We added some some um, some binders and stiffeners. Some more organic. It's an organic product. And what that did was two things. It made the product a little more stable. So it extended the shelf life from 12 months to 24 months, but it also made it less sensitive to storage temperature. So again, you could store this product as long as it's out of uh, direct sunlight, you can store it in a barn, metal shed. It just, it just stores much easier than the, um, than the Max. Also being a slightly drier, firmer product, it makes the application a fair bit easier where you can get it out of the package, separate the strips faster. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more as we, as we move through here. Um, so again, just, just to, to recap the, some of the differences from the Mightaway Quick Strips and the Formic Pro. Whoops, let's go back there. Um, both the, okay, I don't know why my slide is advancing. Both the products have um, two treatment options. Why do I quick strips? Uh, option one is two strips for seven days. Option two is what we call one plus one. Uh, one strip for seven days. You wait seven days, and on day 14, you put on the second strip for a total of 21 days. With the Formic Pro, option one is two strips for 14 days. Option two is one strip for 10 days apply the set second strip for a second 10 days for a total of 20 days. Um, I talked a little bit about the shelf life. The Mighty Way Quick Strips has a one year shelf life. The Formic Pro has a 24 month or two, two year shelf life. The Mighty Way Quick Strips needs to be stored cooler than 25 Celsius or 77 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, Formic Pro really does not have a temperature restriction. It just needs to be out of sunlight. Um, the product can be stored frozen or in a fridge. It actually stores very well that way. Um, it's actually not a bad way to store it at all. Um, you, can, you, can, you can take it out of a fridge or a freezer and apply it right into the hive. You don't have to, because it's, it's not going to freeze solid because it's a gel. But one thing we do like to tell people is for people who are storing their product cool in a fridge or a freezer, that will not extend the shelf life of the product. It will keep it in very good condition, but you still have to go by the expiry date on the package. Um, we often get asked too, with the two treatment options, if we have two treatment options, what is the um, preferred treatment option? My personal treatment, preferred treatment option, and by the company we recommend, is what we call the full dose two strip treat treatment option. The reason for that is 
the product really is designed to vapor off and penetrate the brood cap. That's best done with the two strip option. Um, when, when would someone want to use option two, the one plus one method? Quite often when I'm going through my, my yard and I'm, I'm applying my, uh, my strips, you want to have at least five, six frames of bees when you're doing the full dose option. Really, whether even if you're doing the one plus one option, you want to have at least five, six frames of bees. When I get to, a, to one of my colonies, I'm looking at it and it's kind of marginal. I'm thinking, is it really five frames? It's on the edge, you know, it's, it's a little weaker and it's not as strong. In a case like that, I opt to do the option two, which is the one plus one method. But if you've got a big strong colony and you're following all the rest of the treatment recommendations, parameters, which we'll get into, um, we do recommend uh, the, the option one, the full dose two strips. The, again here, um, with the Mite Away Quick Strips, two strips for seven days, Formic Pro, two strips for 14 days. Um, with the second option, we just went through that. With Max, it's one strip for seven days. You wait seven days. So you're gonna put the second strip on day 14 for another seven days for a total of 21 days. Um, a Formic Pro, apply the first strip for 10 days, remove and replace the second strip for an additional 10 days for a total of 20 days. Um, something to keep in mind is when we talk about a seven day treatment or a 14 day treatment, a lot of times we'll get people calling us saying, you know, in my area, it's gonna be hot next week and the temperatures are creeping up or the weather is not gonna be ideal. Um, the ideal situation with these strips is to to always be below the recommended temperature. But keeping in mind, um, most of the formic acid vapors are gonna be released over the first three to four day period. So that's your critical days. The, the first three and four days are the days when the formic acid is gonna cause the most mortality to the varroa mites in all the life stages, including the reproductive ones under the cap. So that's gonna happen in the first three or four days. So they're the days you don't want to be over the 85 degrees recommended uh, temperature. This is just a little uh, gif from our, from our video here where you can see the uh, vapors penetrating the brood cap and uh, killing the mites below the cap. More exciting when you see that in the video, which ho hopefully uh, anyone who hasn't seen it will have a look at the website and look at the video. Um, so again, we talk about what do you need to have a, a successful outcome with, with our product? Um, some of the key, the key, um, the key points you're going to need to, to follow as, as per the label is your recommended temperature guidelines for both max and for macro are between 50 degrees Fahrenheit and 85 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't know if we have any Canadians on, but that would be between 10 and 30 degrees Celsius. Another uh, very important um, information is that entrance reducers need to be off. So your entrances need to be fully open. You don't wanna have entrance reducers on. If you do have screen bottom boards, uh, ideally you want them to be closed. So if you have the slide or the drawer, that should be closed. It's counterintuitive for some, they think the more ventilation, the better. But actually with a screen buying board, uh, it dumps out a little bit too fast and it really does uh, lower the efficacy. Uh, I'll assume that most people are small scale um, hobbyist beekeepers on tonight. But if we do have um, commercial beekeepers on or somebody who's palletized, who has, you know, uh, permanently reduced entrances that are built into your, um, into your pallet, so that you don't actually have an entrance reducer that you take in or out, it's always reduced, as you can see down here in the center photos. Then what we advise is um, in order to get proper ventilation, you'll pull back your, uh, your, your second box, either pull it back or move it forward to give it about an inch um, to make up for that reduced entrance. The other option is to shim, but I think very few people do that. Uh, you can shim the bottom up, but most people will opt to uh, pull back their, their super or pull back their second brood box. Um, when it comes to hive configuration and 
placement of the strips. Uh, this information will be the same for the Mightaway Crick strips or the Formic Pro. Um, I myself run single brew boxes. Um, so, you know, what we see up here top left, one deep uh, brew box, that's my configuration all year. So when I put my strips on, I always make sure I have at least one honey super on, sometimes two, but we really don't advise putting two strips on a single deep without another box. Uh, the bees can be overwhelmed by some of the vapors and by having a second uh, box uh, or a third box, it gives, it gives the bees uh, room to, to move up and expand the cluster. Um, you can use it with queen excluder, I do. I place my two strips, my queen excluder and my one honey super. For people who are running double brood boxes, strips always between the two brood boxes. We get asked all the time, you know, can I put the strips on top of the upper brew box? No, both Max and Formic Pro are brood treatments. You know, we're really trying to penetrate the um, brood caps. We're trying to kill the mites that are reproducing in the brood. So it's best to have those strips really in the heart of the brood nest in between the two boxes. The, I've been asked um, a question a few times. We don't have it on the illustration here because we try to you know, keep to the most standard used equipment, but we have more and more people using um, medium boxes, whether it's uh, medium 10 frame boxes or medium eight frame boxes. If you're using Tom, I think you may have frozen up there. Okay. Okay, I think you're back. Perfect. Back? Yeah, okay. we, we lost you right when you were describing the uh, eight frame mediums. Okay, th thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, so if, so if you're using, you know, um, uh, eight frame equipment, whether it's eight frame tens or eight frame mediums, um, you're gonna put the strips on the second box, above the second box. We, although with our standard 10 frame equipment, we keep the strips on the bottom box. That's a little too close to the entrance for medium boxes. So we would say put the strips on the second box. Um, and then if you have your third, if you have three, three, three boxes of brood boxes, you'd put it on top of the second with the third brood box on top. So ho hopefully that's, uh, that's, cle that's clear enough for people. Um, so that's placement of strips. Uh, we cover the entrance, reducers, uh, screen bottom boards we want closed. Um, all right. So when you're using the, when you're using uh, either Max or Formic Pro for the first time, one of the things we like to talk about or what you're gonna see are the common observances. Myself, you know, I, I, I came to Nod basically already as, as a customer, uh, you know, I got my introduction to beekeeping on an organic farm. So, so for me, synthetic miticides weren't an option. So I was very, very used to using the Mightaway Quick Strips even before I came to work for Nod. Um, like most beekeepers, the first time I used it, I saw some dead bees on my landing board and I saw some, some, some dead larvae and I was kind of freaked out and I thought I had killed my hive and I was sort of, um, yeah, I was at the beekeeping supply store asking them what the heck went wrong. Um, I've come to learn this is a pretty common observance. You know, because, because the product is, trying, is, is designed to penetrate the brood cap, we, you are going to kill some, some, some of the young, younger op open brood. So it's not, it's, not, um, it's not unusual to see this and to see some dead bees. Um, and usually you're going to see this in the first day, second day. I don't see it much past day three. It's usually the first day and second day. Also a, a pretty common observance is to see brooding, uh, to see bearding, you know, where the bees come out of the hive and they cover the front of the hive. Um, and again, that's a very common observance in the first couple of days. Although interestingly enough, I see that less and less with, um, with my colonies. And, and I don't know if that's because, you know, you know, the, the, the bees are just, I'm using it twice a year and the, our colonies get used to it. I really don't have an answer for that, but most of us who use the product regularly, we do notice that the bearding thing seems to, to uh, not be as pronounced when you're using it for the first couple of times. 
the we typically advise people um, when they if they see this you know if a few dead bees uh, to not and particularly this is really more for the newer beekeepers to not panic and not go in and open up the hive and take the strips out um, because it, again like I said it is it is a common service we we, we expect that is going to happen um, when it comes to any treatment our treatment any of the treatments out there I didn't touch on this earlier but it really is important to um, to know your mite levels. I myself personally, I monitor monthly from, from May to October, I monitor alcohol wash at least once a month. That may be excessive for some people, but I don't think so. I think everyone should be doing their alcohol washes once a month. And if not, at least spring, midsummer, and early fall. Um, and by doing those numbers early, you're going to know whether you need to treat, whether you reach the economic threshold for treatment in your area, which is, that will be different for most areas. But, and also importantly, post-treatment, it's important to do, um, to monitor your viral levels post-treatment, to know, you know, did this product work? You know, whether it's our product or whatever product you're using. So, because our product is, is designed to penetrate the brood cap, we recommend to do your alcohol wash on day 21. So 21 days after you've done the treatment, because by that time, for sure, any, any cap brood would have hatched out. So any of those mites that were below the cap um, should have been killed. And any of the mites that um, were not killed have probably been rendered um, sterile hardly they're not going to reproduce after being exposed to the formic acid in the brood cap. Um, okay so um, as far as far as research goes our website has a um, has a, a ton of research our own internal research and a lot of third-party research for people who are inclined and, and like to read research papers again nodglobal.com you'll find it there. Um, as far as efficacy goes, our mite away quick strips run around 90 to 95%. These are under ideal con conditions. You know, the average may be a little bit lower because it's, it's, again, these are, we always are, are under the most ideal conditions. Formic Pro is 83 to 97%. The efficacy numbers I'm quoting here are on the um, full dose two strip option, or option one, which is the uh, full dose two strip options. The efficacy will drop a little bit um, when you do the one plus one, but surprisingly enough, it doesn't drop that much. It is slightly lower, but for those who are inclined um, to not do the two two strips, uh, you can you can um, you can do the one plus one. But personally, I like to get as high as efficacy as possible, so I'm always going to do the two strips if my colony is strong enough. If I've got more than five six frames of bees, I'm I'm doing the two strips. Um, for uh, some of you, some of you uh, may know who Randy Oliver is. Randy Oliver is a commercial beekeeper in California, Northern California. He's also does a lot of practical research for beekeepers, and he has a website, scientificbeekeeping.com. Um, Randy has trialed our products over the years, our, our, our first generation products, uh, our, our Mightaway Two products, our Max, and, and now our Formic Pro. And uh, you know, one of the things he was saying in his his last presentation. Is that you know of course the mite kill was was impressive ninety percent reduction at four weeks as compared to one hundred percent increase in the control hives, but the photo on the right is really interesting because a lot of people think that because you're killing some brood and it is going to set your um, your colonies back a little bit. When I talked about you know the common observations, I, I talked about the um, you know, the dead brood, some dead brood and some, some bee mortality on the landing board and the bearding. Uh, another sort of common observation you're going to see is that it is not uncommon at all for the queen to stop laying for a couple of days. You put your treatment in, you go back in uh, a week later in the case of Max or 14 days later, um, your queen may have stopped laying, usually could be four days to a week, um, but by two weeks post-treatment, you know that queen will be kicked back in, and you'll be start seeing some, some. It's almost, it's almost like um, we we almost. It's almost like a cleanse. It's really interesting to see. And Randy talks about this a lot. 
And in this photo, you can see that um, uh, when you shake in that photo, nectar that's coming out. So they did not slow down foraging at all. This is, this is two weeks post-treatment and they're still foraging full on. They're bringing in a lot of nectar. Um, another, another sort of interesting thing is um, I was, I was, uh, I was uh, listening to one of uh, Randy's presentations a couple of weeks ago he was, he was doing, and the presentation was really about some of the research he's doing with the auxilic acid and glycerin with the different delivery mechanisms but he was always using some controls and comparing it against other products. And in this case, he was using uh, Formic Pro. Um, uh, looking at his photos there, um, that brood pattern, again, this is two weeks post-treatment, you're looking great. Um, and the photo on the right, which is, which is interesting, um, you know, his quote, despite the treatment, the stronger Formic treated, when he's saying the stronger Formic, he's talking about the two strip options. The hives drew out largely filled 10 frames of foundation. So if they're drawing, you know, 10 frames of foundation post-treatment, you know it did not have a serious effect um, on the bees. So they, they, they bounce back very quick. You know, so I, it's, again, that's what I always tell people, don't, don't get too alarmed when you see some, some dead bees or you see the queen slow down because uh, you'll always get um, the queen kick, 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 kicking back in. Um, Mark shared earlier in the screen, the Honeybee Health Coalition um, guidebook. That's my go-to book. Anybody, any new beekeeper who's not sure about products, our products, other products, uh, you know, great resource. The Honeybee Health Coalition is a, is a great resource. Um, and again, you can, check, you can check our website for our own internal research and um, our other, okay, what happened here? Well, let's go back. Okay. So um, before I move on to our Bee Cozy Winter Hive Wraps, I thought maybe it'd be good to take a break and sort of, if anyone does have any questions on the formic acid products before we talk, uh, talk about winter wraps, um, I'm open now if that works for you, Mark. Yeah, absolutely. We did have a couple come in through the chat. So let me go through these real quick. Okay. Um, the first one came through, and I'd, I'd love your perspective on this. What is your advice for year-long mite treatment? Need to change the uh, need to change the treatments for uh, efficacy. I'm assuming, to like, w would you want to change them up for efficacy? Uh, I, you know, I have a problem with that in a way, and and it, and it, it, I'm, I'm going to be honest and straightforward. Um, you know, I look at our own experience, right? Myself. I've only ever used formic acid products, right? Um, I dabbled a little bit with thymol products and I have to be honest about the thymol products I used. I was so new, it was like my, my second and third year beekeeping that I can't, I didn't really, I can't honestly say I evaluated them well enough or I didn't really have the knowledge to, to evaluate them well enough. Um, but I know I've used uh, formic acid I think we locked up again there, Tom. Back. Oh, there we go. We got you back now. I'm back. You were saying, you know, you had used uh, thymol early on in your beekeeping career. Right. But I, I was too new to really, you know, to give it a fair shake to evaluate it. Um, I have used formic acid twice a year, basically for 10 years. And only recently have I followed up the odd time in the fall with an oxalic acid um, follow-up. Now, having said that, you know, we, we have near, not seen any signs of resistance. Um, from a scientific point of view, from a research point of view, you know, you know, I heard Samuel Ramsey the other night on his presence say, never say never. You know, a, a lot of research on other products, they thought you'll never get resistant, it won't happen. But to date, we haven't. One of the things we do recommend, though, is some of our commercial beekeepers who are still using um, some of the synthetic products, you know, particularly Apivar, and are still having success with it, because of the possibility of, of um, amitraz resistance, it's actually not a bad idea for some of those people to integrate 
an organic product into their mix to help extend the life of that synthetic. Because, you know, we saw this historically. That's what happened with some of the previous synthetics. They worked so well that people used them, <laughs> you know, twice a year, three times a year, to the point where they stopped working. So you can actually use, you know, some of the organic products like ours, like the formic acid, to extend those products. So I know whenever I hear anyone do a beekeeping course, uh, most of the researchers will tell people to rotate their products. Um, it's probably not bad advice. Um, and I would never argue with that. But I would also say I've used formic acid twice a year <laughs> you know, for more than 10 years. You know, David at our place has been using formic acid 25 years for twice a year and you know, has not seen resistance. So I, don't, I, don't, I hope that kind of answers the question. Yeah, and I think it's fair to say too with that, you know, constantly monitoring, having that feedback loop of making sure the product is working well, that you're not getting resistance is important to that as well. And I think you've, you've covered that in, in there before about talking about how often you monitor. So yeah, yeah all in all, I think that's a, a good answer. Yeah. Um, the next question, they, and this was just a clarification, is for the two-dose option, uh, or for the option number two, it was at a, a seven day wait time or 14 day wait time? Um, for the Midaway quick strips? I, I believe that's what that was in reference to. Uh, for the Midaway, uh, first strip for seven days. So you, 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 uh, you, you wait seven days. So on day 14, you would put on the second strip on day 14. Like the strip is basically expired after day seven, but we still like to wait a week before putting on the second strip. And so, that, so, you, so, so it'll be a total of 21 day treatment. Okay. You have seven, a break for seven, and another seven, right? Okay. With the Formic Pro, we say one strip for 10 days. You don't have to wait, go back in on day, day 10 with the second strip. Okay. For 20 days. And then a uh, question came in, what is the expected bee mortality in the first three to four days with this product? And then the uh, addition to the question is with the two strip option. With the two strip option, you know, it, it it really it really depends on it really depends on the um, see w w temperature. You know, once you get above that 80, 85 degrees, you know, you're risking more 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 sort of bee mortality, right? Some guys will go as high as ninety. Um, that's beyond our label and beyond my comfort zone. I like eighty five. You know, you're 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 pushing it beyond that. Um, so if you're treating let's say when your temperatures are more like 65 70 75 you're probably less you're probably going to see less bee mortality than if you were treating when it's right on 85 you might see a little more with, with the heat the other thing too that's really that's really going to make a difference is um having those entrance reducers off and having adequate cavity space having a second box on top um you know i had a an email from a first time user in texas um who was treating with single deeps and had a fair bit of bee mortality, but he didn't put on a second box. He didn't put a super on and, you know, all of our literature, our website, all our instructions always say you want to give them some room to expand the cluster. I always tell new beekeepers, and, this, and sometimes this is a little tricky for new beekeepers. If you're in your first year and you want to use this product and you've got your nuke into your 10 frame box and the frames are drawn out, but your second box isn't drawn out. You don't even have a bo second box of drawn frames. I tell people still put that box on top with the box of foundation, put your strips in. And then, you know, in the case of uh, Formic Pro after day 14, go back, shake the bees off that foundation back into their single box. You know, um, th that's always an option too. Okay. That's Better good. to have a box of foundation than say an empty box with nothing in it. Okay. Good, good advice there. Um, next question is, is does the polysaccharide um, delivery Joe, does it contain glycerin? Uh, no. Okay. Um, and then let me switch over here. That's all I had before, but I think we've had quite a number of, of questions come in. Um, when is the best time to use Midaway Quick Strips? Yeah, well, again, you know, keep in mind, um, we don't have limitations as far as, you know, honey supers, because you can use it during the flow and you can use it while your supers are on. So one of, you know, one of the nice parts about it is that you can use it as a midsummer treatment as long as you're within that temperature window. And I know that can get tricky in certain areas. For, for me, you know, here in Southern Ontario, 
I always catch, I don't have a problem getting below 85. I'll always, either the second week of August or third week, I'll always get that window. I know as you get into places like California and Florida, that could be dicey. Um, spring, so I've, I've used it basically spring and, and midsummer. But, but again, I think, um, I think it goes back to the question mark is that I, you know, I used to have my own personal belief that, you know, the most important time was to knock those bees down in, 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 you know, August before the queen starts laying what will be your winter bees. Right. And I think that's true, you know, um, but also it's not to say, well, I'll let it go through the spring because if you don't monitor in the spring and you're above threshold, they're only going in one direction. That's up. So you, you, you might have a bigger problem than you can deal with midsummer. So, so, you know, the most important, so for me, really, it comes down to it's the two critical times are spring and midsummer to have those numbers down. Yeah. And so actually I'm going to um, roll out a little bit of new knowledge that we have coming out of the lab this year. One of our uh, graduate students, uh, Dr. Kelly Gohannon just uh, finished her thesis and uh, found that in best management practices where colonies are kept with lowest amount of uh, mites throughout the year, a lower amount starting in the spring versus just starting in, in later in the year, that the virus titers were significantly lower in those colonies than ones that were just treated towards the, the end of the year to knock down the mite levels. So we're finding it's a cumulative effect, not, not an additive effect to it. Yes. So yeah. that, 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 that kind of changes things a little bit, but at the, at the end of the day, keeping your mite numbers as low as possible is, is the best thing that you can do for it. Yeah, I think we have to get away from that. Oh, my mite level's out of control. I got to whack them and knock them down. I call mm -hmm. it band-aid solution. No, it's got to be constant yeah. maintenance. The goal is to never let them get to that state. Yep, yep, exactly. And so um, the next question has to do with um, nooks is a colony minimum, is, is, uh, a colony minimum of 10,000 bees is required for these treatments according to the directions. Mm -hmm. That's not five or six frames of bees, it's less. What is, what is your number of bees for six frames? Wait, um, so it is, yeah, it is, it is less, but keep in mind that it's also cavity size too, right? You know, that small nuke, it, you know, it, you, it, they can be overwhelmed. Uh, so you know, historically we've told people not to treat nukes with our product. We know some guys have been doing some off-label experimenting and, you know, with, with um, one strip or cutting a strip, something we don't really ad advise. Um, on that note, um, you know, we, 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 have a, we have a new a new a new researcher joining us at Nod, and we have a list of research projects that we want to revisit. And one of them is nucleus colonies. We would like to do some. Well, it's not just nuclear. We're going to be doing some research around cavity size, different hive types. Because um, all our research is basically done on Langstroth 10 frame equipment. And so we want, we, we really want to sort of get a little more accurate information on what you can do in a smaller cavity like a nuke. Maybe there is a, a sort of a formic acid uh, size pad that we can, can use. So that's, uh, that's on, our, on our sort of uh, research list. Uh, that's great to hear because I think that would be really great for uh, beekeepers starting out and also for uh, nook producers because they could treat with, uh, have another product to treat with. Um, next question that came in, uh, what happens if the product is used beyond the expiration date? Yeah, the, um, a, well, look, let's take the mite away quick strips, for example. The, you know, some of the synthetic miticides, as they expire, they, they lose their potency, right? They, they become less effective. Our formic acid is kind of the opposite. It's a really stable active ingredient. It's our polysaccharide gel pad that breaks down. So okay. what so what happens is it's not the product gets weaker, the product gets stronger. We lose the slow release technology. So you put these strips in, the minute you take them out of the sachet, you know, if they're they're soft, they're goopy, and they, they smell a lot, and they just vapor off like a big blast. Mm. And that can be hard on your, your bees, it can be hard on the queen. Um, so that's why we recommend sort of, you know, if you can keep them cool. So just from a sort of uh, label as a law, law with when it comes to the, to the to max, we really advise people not to use it beyond the, beyond the expiry date. And, and then again, that's one of the reasons why we developed the Formic Pro by putting in those, the, the, those, those uh, 
those uh, binder stiffeners, it, it, it sort of made it a more stable, made the polysaccharide more stable, which gave us that two year shelf life. Yeah. Okay. And it looks like we have a, a, a few questions here. I think you've already kind of answered them about uh, higher temperatures, but there is, is definitely a, a request for uh, seeing if you could reformulate your product to use in higher temperatures. Because mm -hmm. I, I can tell you here in Maryland, we have an issue that after our honey flow in about April to May, uh, temperatures skyrocket. I mean, you can have 90 degrees very quickly. And so it becomes an issue. So I, I think there's a, a lot of hope for uh, the possibility for that. So is, is, is that something that may happen or is given the, the rates of evaporation and everything with it, is that something probably not likely? Oh, I think you may have frozen there, Tom. There we go, we got you back. I think just the chemistry of formic acid, um, can you hear me still? Yep, loud and clear. I, I don't, to be honest, Mark, I know, I don't, I don't think we're gonna be able to crack that nut just because the nature of formic acid. Okay, and and that's a, a great yeah. answer. Yeah. It would be nice. Um, so here's a question, does sunlight or direct sun on the colonies affect the temperature recommendations or is it just ambient temperature? I would say no, ambient temperature. And mainly because, um, you know, like I said, I'm an urban beekeeper and I keep my, you know, my University of Toronto roof, right? I keep on that one. I think I have 14 colonies up there. It's a black tar roof. It's scorching hot up there. Um, I, I want to go up there first thing in the morning or late in the day. Uh, my Cuban wife loves being up there midday. She's <laughs> never, never heard the word too hot in 20 years. Um, but surprisingly, I don't see any negative effect on the bees. They regulate the temperature there. Um, they, they actually thrive on that roof. It's amazing how well they can do that. Now this question came in, it's a great question, is what is the impact of humidity on the treatments? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And that's, um, that's kind of at the top of our list on our research projects that we're gonna be doing. Um, the, it's, 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 it's an odd one for us, Mark, because like, for example, we have customers in subtropical regions who use it. I mean, we have com large scale commercial guys in Hawaii who use the product and been using it there for years and they like it. Yet we get anecdotal reports from places like Florida saying this product just does not respond the same in Florida the way it does in California. Um, and up until now, we haven't had great research on that. So we are, we are, um, I'm really hoping that in a year from now, two years from now, we can actually an answer that with some real research and not, our, not what we think and not our theories. Yeah. That sounds good. Well, we, we'll probably hold you to that. We'll ask you. Yeah. <laughs> in but, a year. But I think it's extreme. You know, like I, I hear people, sometimes people in, in New York tell me it's too humid and I'm like, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> I, I can tell you, I fought really hard and long to say that they don't get humid days in Maryland. And I, I've been proven wrong. And I, I grew up in Florida. So <laughs> it, 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 it's amazing how humidity can, can affect different regions. Um, we did have a question come in on, is mass still available or is it being phased out? That um, said that some distributors, they don't sell the Mite Away Quick Strips anymore. Yeah. Um, hmm. When we launched Formic Pro, we, um, you know, they say, like Coca-Cola, don't ever assume anything, right? <laughs> our, our assumption was the products are so similar that people will just migrate to the new product and it'll be easier for all our resellers to carry the one SKU. So, you know, um, what we found is that we still have a very large following in the U.S. who like Max and they've learned how to use it. Um, it's a little bit cheaper price-wise in Formic Pro. So they know, they know when they're going to use it. They know when they're going to store it. So for them, they like it. So, and our, our, the demand is still there. So we're, we're, we have no immediate um, plans to, to, to do away with Max. Now, it does create a challenge for some of our really smaller retailers. You know, the big guys like Man Lake and Dayton, they'll carry both, you know. You know but when some of the smaller local guys, it's hard for them to carry both. So some of them have made the choice, no, we're just carrying Formic Pro. And for, for, and, you know, for a new beekeeper, anybody coming in, I think that's a great choice. It's still a very good product. You know, um, in Canada here, because we have a much smaller market, 
we, we tend to have taken Macs off, but we will make it for commercial guys. Like, you know, the guys who have been used for years, if they want to buy it by the pilot, we will make it for them. Yeah. So there's okay. no real immediate um, plans to do away with it. Okay. Um, and then a couple of other questions, and these were some of the pre-submitted ones. I just want to make sure we get to them is, um, have you studied any of the synergistic effects of the products combined with uh, fungicides or other chemicals? I know there's a lot of concern these days about that, the synergistic effects, um, especially with fungicides. We're, we're learning a lot more about that. And so I was wondering if that's anything that's been looked into yet. No, not, not by us. I, I, I honestly think that's a little out of our realm. That's probably going to be something that's done at university level researchers. Yeah. 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 I know but Reed it, Johnson did a, a study a, a number of years ago, but I'm positive uh, Formic wasn't in that. Yeah. I, I, I think I remember seeing that. There was some of the synthetics that they looked at, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Amitrez and a couple of the fungicides reacted very poorly. So right. Yeah, that may be a, a good thesis for a, a graduate student. Um, let me see here. It was also asked if, if a package is opened of the uh, Mitoway Quick Simple Formic Pro and they don't use all the dosage, can they save it for later? How long will they last once the packaging has been opened? Yeah, no, that, that's a good question because the um, our packaging is a little different than some of the other, like, for example, um, some of the synthetics are in like a uh, vacuum pack seal, right? So when you open, say, a 10 pack, all the 10 strips are exposed. Our package, packaging is very different. Each one of our doses, which is two strips, is contained in our, in our, in our sachet, which is a mylar foil type sachet, right? So when you buy, um, as long as you don't open that foil, like, cause they come two in a pouch or in a case, let's say a 10 pack, there's 10 of those foil pouches inside a resealable Ziploc bag. So you can open that bag and treat five year hives and have five doses left because they're still inside that sealed sachet. So again, as long as you're storing it out of direct sunlight, um, cool's good. Doesn't have to be if it's for micro, but if you got cool, that's good. Um, just don't, but no, yeah, that, that is one of the things about our 10 pack. You open our 10 pack, each one of those doses is individually wrapped, unlike some of the synthetics where you open a 10 pack and you've broken the, the seal. So that's really not an issue for ours. The only time you'll run into that issue with our product is a hobbyist who's um, uh, treating maybe the one plus one method has an odd number of hives and ends up with one strip from inside a, you know, mm -hmm. inside the foil sachet, then in that case, you're probably gonna have to toss that one. And you're talking, you know, half a, half a dose. So you're probably talking $2.50. Okay. Okay. And then a comment came in, a pretty insightful one that said that, um, so temperature below 85, but the brood chamber on average is 92 to 93. So I, I guess the, the, the take home with that is, is it's all about the ambient temperature outside the hive of the air that's circulating through, not the internal brood temperature for as far as dosing goes. Correct. Okay. Okay. Well, I think we've, we've managed to whittle away through most of the questions. Um, you answered a lot of them in the, um, the chat. We did have one come through. Any studies on queen mortality? Yeah, um, we, well, there's been a lot of external studies. Um, one thing we know, one, one thing we know about queen mortality, and I think that's pretty much anybody who's used the product or, or has done the research around, around queen mortality is, you know, an interesting story is when I first started working for Nod and I went out to visit one of our large commercial guys who've been using it for years, I asked him about that. I said, you know, what's your experience with queen mortality? And he said to me, you know, I lose about 10% of my queens a year. He says, when I use my mind away quick steps, that number doesn't change. It just happens faster. And he said, what happens is, is when I apply those strips, it pushes out my older queens, my queens that were sort of um, probably not putting out a strong pheromone scent. He says, yeah, it does them in because, you know, I, I think the theory is the colony gets those vapors. The queen's already putting out a, a lighter pheromone scent. It gets masks. They think there's something wrong with her. It tri triggers supersedure. Um, he says that was probably going to happen anyway. So was that an issue? Um, we see it with older queens, and I've seen it early in the season, sometimes with poorly mated queens. Um, typically, first year queens, second year queens, you don't see a lot of that. Um, again, going back to anyone who's listened in the last few weeks to any of uh, Randy's recent study that he's been doing with that oxalic acid glycerin, 
one of the things he documented was queen loss with his controls, with his formic pro, with their axillic acid and glycerin. Um, the queen loss was, was no higher. There was some, there was some um, supersedure, but it was no higher than the axillic acid and glycerin. Um, the queen loss thing for us has always been one of those questions that, um, does it happen? Yes. Can it happen? Yes. I don't think it happens at the level that people talk about. Um, I also think with some of the inexperienced beekeepers, and I've experienced this a lot, we talked about it earlier, that when you use the strips, it's not uncommon for the queen to stop laying for three, four days to a week. So some people will go in there on day seven, open the hive, and you know, you know how it is for newer beekeepers finding your queen. Sometimes it's a challenge to find her. They don't see her. They don't see any eggs or larva, and they think, I've done in my queen, they order a new queen, they put the queen in, and by that time, you know, she's laying again. Um, this, we see this one a lot. Um, so that, that question for me, I mean, me personally, um, last August, uh, 14 colonies on that one roof, treated in August, it was getting warm. I was getting close to that 85. Uh, I had three super seizures in my 14. And because now I'm at the point where I keep good records in my first couple of years, I couldn't tell you. Now I can tell you that they were third year queens. Didn't surprise me at all. Okay. So something to look at and, and perhaps let it, let the colony go for just a little bit longer to make sure that the uh, queen starts laying again. And if not, then it might be time to replace the, the queen. So that's yeah, good to know. Don't, don't rush in there too quick and order a new queen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We see that sometimes coming out of winter too. People don't realize that it may take her a few few weeks to start laying again after the cold weather passes. Um, so that's all the questions. If you want to switch back to uh, talking about the hive wraps, we'd love to sure. hear about that. We're doing okay for time. Yeah, we've got about uh, 25 minutes left. So oh, good. Okay. Okay. So we won't spend too much time here. So we, uh, we make, we manufacture a product called the Bee Cozy Winter Hive Wrap. Um, people have been using this in Western Canada and Manitoba and Alberta for the past 25 years. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a really easy product to use. It's slip, if you can tell by the photo here, the nice thing about the Bee Cozy Wrap is that it's a slip on slip off type of wrap, which basically means that if for any reason you wanted to go in and do a quick hive inspection, you know, midwinter or early spring, you don't have to unwrap. You just pull it down a little bit. The, um, it's an R8 insulation inside a, a plastic. You can see in the photo here, it's got a, um, it's got what we call a chimney. It's not meant to be tight, tight to the hive. What happens is um, the bees on those warm days where they wanna come out and do a cleansing flight, they can come out through the upper entrance or the ores and you'll quite often see them behind the bee cozy coming out from inside the bee cozy. Um, we, you know, we call this bee cozy a, um, uh, we, we call it a winter wrap, but, you know, I really kind of tend to think of them as a, as a spring wrap because I think there's enough research out there that will tell you a colony that is healthy, that is treated for Varroa, that is well-fed and of adequate strength can survive the winter. It can survive our Canadian winters and can probably survive without being wrapped because there are people who don't wrap their hives. Um, what you definitely do need is on top here, we don't see it in this photo, we'll show it as we move on, but we have an insulating, we call it insulating pillow, which is an insulation. I think it's essential to have that insulation between your inner and outer cover. So when the colony is generating a lot of heat in the winter, even though it's cold outside, they're generating a lot of heat. If that heat rises and hits a cold outer cover, it condensates, can drip, your bees can get wet and that's really what does in your bees, getting, getting wet, not, not being cold. So that insulation in between the inner outer cover is um, critical. Um, so if I call it a spring wrap and I say bees can survive without being wrapped, so why wrap? <laughs> um, where these things uh, really pay for themselves is they act as a good windbreak. You'll get some solar gain, but where the differences we see is come spring when you still have the sort of a freeze thaw cycle where you get the warm days, but then at night it uh, becomes cool again and drops below zero, below freezing. Um, 
when we measure colonies that are wrapped and colonies that are not wrapped, the queen will always start laying a little bit earlier in the colonies that are wrapped. And what that means is you'll have bigger colonies coming into the spring, which means, you know, actually equates to larger colonies and more, more honey. Um, but also this time of year in particular, as soon as we get those days where bees start flying, you know, our phone starts ringing off the hook and people say, should I take my wraps off? And we say, no, now is the best, you know, now is where they really pay for themselves because as your bees have gone through winter, uh, they can, they start consuming their feed. And, you know, we all know that this is when bees tend to starve in our area in the North here, typically March, April, you make them March, April, then they could starve if they don't have feed. Um, by having your hive wrapped, um, you're helping them control the temperature inside, which basically means they're not having to work as hard and they're not going to consume as much feed. So it can actually help, help you conserve, help them conserve feed, which will help them conserve energy. So these are sort of, um, some of the benefits to, to, to wrapping as we see it. Um, in our instructions on how to use it here, we advise people to put a little nail in the bottom to keep the bee cozy off the front of the hive. Um, even if you're not wrapping, we advise people have tilt your hive forward if you get any moisture so the water will run out. Uh, bee cozy, sometimes they expand the insulation. So we tell people to squeeze the air out of them um, before you put them on the hive and you slide them on the hive. Personally, I don't put a nail myself. I just, um, like when you see in the previous photo here, I take this chimney here with my hands and I just pull it and keep it off the front of the hive. And that tends to work well enough for me. Some people will actually put a little bit of two by two in there. But if you're inclined not to wanna to put a nail or a screw in your landing board, um, I personally get by without doing that. Um, what else do we have? Yeah, so if you see in the, in, the, in the photos here, you see the seam. A lot of people look at the seam and they think it's an ugly looking seam, so they throw it around the back of the hive. It's actually quite important to be in the front because that's, that's what we call the, uh, the chimney. It, it causes a, basically like a little chimney in behind. They can travel in behind there. Um, upper entrances are critical. This, um, you know, we, we believe that uh, upper entrance helps them vent out, vent out some of the excess moisture. I myself use these deep inner covers um, our inner pillow goes in between the inner cover. So that's the insulation that stops that hot air from coming up, hitting your, um, your telescopic cover. You can, you can get our pillow to work with the normal, the standard shallow covers. It's a little tricky and it won't, tends to push up the telescopic cover, but I end up putting bricks on top of mine anyway, so that'll do it. But my preference these days is this uh, deep, deeper, deeper cover. Um, and when the, um, sorry, when we uh, get to the end of the season, you can slide them off. If they did happen to get any moisture in, we say just leave them in the sun, let them dry a little bit and you roll them back up, compress the air out of them. I tend to put an elastic band on them and store them in these um, sort of plastic uh, Tupperware bins there I get at Home Depot. Um, yeah, so that's kind of our, our bee cozy in a nutshell. It's uh, our winter wrap that I like to call uh, the spring wrap where it really pays for itself in the spring. Um, any, any question, any questions on the, uh, on the bee cozy wrap? Okay. I don't see any in the, the chat. Do a lot of people wrap in your area, Mark in Maryland? Um, it's hit or miss. Not a whole lot. We don't get a lot of, uh, very cold days. Um, uh, so it, it tends not to be in certain areas they do, especially up in the mountain areas, they'll, they'll wrap. Yeah. Um, somebody asked, will it fit on a hive with handles? Um, I guess that would depend, you, you know, it depends because they're all slightly different. Um, hard to, I would say, you know, maybe buy, buy one, try it first before you buy them all. Um, you know, an, in an interesting thing about these wraps is that the, um, we have a lot of commercial guys in Western Canada who winter their colonies inside, inside, inside their winter barns, their winter sheds. Yeah. And one of the challenges they face is they bring them out. And then sometimes it drops real cold again. And with the big colonies, they say, okay, they're out. We'll leave them out. Right. But we have a couple of guys who overwinter nucleus colonies in six frame nukes. And they put three of them on a pallet, which equates to the same dimension as two 10 frame boxes. We've had people ask us to make them a custom size to put on these nukes that are only going to be wrapped for a couple of weeks. 
you know, and it seems like an, it seems like a, an expense to have something wrapped for a few weeks, but they, they, they realize, you know, that's why I say it's not a winter wrap. It's a spring wrap because that's when they're fragile during that spring period when the Queens are kicking in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we, we've got a few people who will wrap their nukes in them. Okay. And the question that came in, um, can you speak more about the wet co wet bee cozies? Yeah. Originally, see, a bee cozy has a vent. It has a vent and it's kind of, uh, it's hard to explain, but the, um, so you can compress the air out of it. What we found was when they're on the hive a certain way, with your hive is tilting forward with water running off the uh, top of the hive, with our previous generation, water would collect in those and they would get wet and pretty heavy. So, you know, it was sort of, uh, you know, our, our, current, our current generation now, we fixed that. The, the vent is now sort of in the center and it's a, it's a double reverse vent. So what happens is water won't run into it. So that happens less and less. The only time you're going to get water in them now is if you actually tear one, um, because they can tear if you, you know, if you're not careful sliding them on and off. If you know if you get old hives or, you know, and in a case like that, um, it's not very sightly. But I have a couple old ones that uh, I've been using for quite a while now, you know, and you'll see the uh, the uh, the duct tape on them because I've ripped them with you know pulling them off the corner too fast or have accidentally ripped them with my hive tool. Um, so I know we did, you know, to be honest, in the earlier generation, we did get some complaints about water running in through our vent system, but that has been rectified. So if you're getting water in the new ones, you probably have torn it and it needs to be, you know, a homemade patch put on it. And, and can they be dried out if they get wet? Oh yeah, yeah. Like even, even, even my older ones that, that would get wet, I, I would pull them off in the spring and just, you know, hang them around the yard, almost like a clothesline. I'd run a piece of, you know, a piece of, uh, of, of cloth, of clothesline and I'd, I'd tie them on so they don't blow away if I got a windy day. And I'd leave them out for a couple of days in the sun and they'd be fine, they'd dry. But, and if you do want to have one that's wet and heavy, you know, you know, you know by the weight when you're picking up if it's absorbed any moisture, you, you don't want to roll that up and, and, and put it away because then it's just going to get mold and- Oh yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Um, and then <clears throat> we did have a question come in. Well, what are the cozy's dimensions? Oh, um, <laughs> the, the dimensions are slightly bigger than a standard Langstroth ten frame box. But we also make it. We we make. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Sorry, I didn't go over that. We make them for ten frame Langstroth for both double deeps, so one that you can go over two deeps, because there's many people in Canada here, like myself, that overwinter in singles. So we make them for a 10 deep single and we make them for um, eight frame equipment, but we just make one size for the eight frame equipment, which is basically we'll cover three or four boxes. Okay. There's nobody over winters less than that anyways with eight frame. Yeah. Yeah. So they, exactly. shouldn't, they shouldn't be. No. Um, then somebody made the comment that they had a uh, mice chew through one of them. So I guess that, that is not not much of a way to prevent that. <laughs> yeah, no, that's um, that's yeah, that happens. I've um, oddly enough, I haven't had that haven't had that happen, but I know it does happen. I've, I've seen it with many, with many beekeepers, um, probably because the bulk of mine are on rooftops. Um, I do have one that's on a farm. Um, but no, yeah, that's um, that becomes a you know. I think that probably, I'm not 100 sure, but I think that's more likely to happen during storage than when it's actually on the hive. Yeah, I would imagine, I, but you never know. Yeah, I and mean, one time it's on the hive, the mice are pretty, pretty dormant by that time. Excellent. Okay. Well, I think that's all the questions that we had come through. Um, we'll give it just another second here, but I want to thank you very much, Tom. And if you don't mind, if you could, uh, do you have a, um, a contact slide at the end here? Oh, do I have a contact? Um, we, um, oh, sorry. It's, um, there we go. Okay. Yeah. Our, 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 um, our, yeah, I'm sorry. I actually forgot to put that on there, but you can, you can reach me. Uh, we have an info, info at nonglobal.com. You can reach me personally at Tom N, like my last name, N, like Nolan. So Tom N at nonglobal.com. And we, um, one of the things we really pride ourselves on, Mark, and uh, I love hearing it when I'm down at conferences or trade shows in the US, we get people come up to our booth all the time and say, wow, you know, I love your company. 
we call somebody actually answers the phone like we really are a customer service like if someone calls with a question i get guys calling you know in the middle of the br question doing an application they're kind of shocked that they'll always get somebody on the phone and we have um we have a pretty educated uh, customer support staff most of whom are beekeepers and even our people who are not beekeepers have been with us so long uh, you would think they are beekeepers from <laughs> <laughs> like they know the they, they know the product inside out so um yeah so you can you can you can reach us uh, anytime you get me personally and, and i can tell you for sure i've had uh, many times i've had beekeepers ask me questions and I've shot off an email at 10 o'clock in the morning and by 11, usually I have an answer from Nod. So I, yeah. I will personally attest to how uh, attentive you guys are with that. Yeah, we're same day. And, you know, Kathleen, myself and Christy, um, we work remotely. We work from home. Even before COVID, we re work remotely. So I think it's just in nature. If, if I get a, if I can inquire at Friday night and I, if I see it, I typically answer it. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Well, if you wouldn't mind, stop sharing your screen. I want to throw up a couple of things from the B-Squad side. Absolutely. And I want to thank you so much for, for joining us this evening. That was a, a great presentation. And I, I, I can say I learned a few things, even though I've used your product for years. Um, and I hope the beekeepers did as well. So let me share my screen here real quick. Well, thank you, Mark. I appreciate the opportunity. And oh, yeah. Thank everyone for logging on. I think it's important too that we hear directly from you guys, you know, where there's a lot of good resources out there like the Honeybee Health Coalition guides and, and that type of thing. But it's also good to have direct contact with, with you. I think we showed that some today about some of the questions and some of the hopefully directions of research that we'll, we'll, uh, you guys will go into in the next few years. So yeah. let's, let's hope we can do that. Yeah. Now, another great piece of research, and I think you, you guys have helped out with this, is the National uh, Loss and Management Survey. That actually goes live next month. And so for you beekeepers out there, big and small, um, please, please, please take the time to go to the Bee Informed Partnerships website and take these, this management survey. Um, I can tell you, uh, previous to my extension appointment at the University of Maryland, I was the chief inspector for the state of Texas. Uh, I worked on a lot of uh, national products, our, our national boards and, and um, efforts. This information was vital when we went to Washington, when we went to the EPA and the USDA um, to ask and to get B legislation passed, this information is used very heavily. So this all requires you guys to go on there, take a little bit of time, answer the questions to the best of your ability, and it will help the entire industry as a whole. So I highly recommend um, if you go on to the beinformed.org, uh, you can sign up for the survey um, I believe you can do it ahead of time. We'll send you an email. If not, uh, go on April 1st. That's when the survey goes live. And so please, please, please check that out because we definitely use that information and the more beekeepers we can get logging onto it, the better it's going to be. So I just want to end um, again. If you guys enjoyed this presentation tonight and we're, we're really uh, looking to plan more of them in the future, um, if you are able to, we understand times are tough, but if you're able to uh, provide donations, we greatly appreciate it. And if you have any questions or comments, um, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I can tell you this time of year, I'm a little busy. We're, we're uh, getting the hives out of winter and everything, but I will answer questions as quickly as I can. Uh, bsquad at umd.edu is our email address. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram. Um, like I said before, this recording will be put on to the YouTube channel. Uh, it takes about 24 hours to process. Uh, probably tomorrow afternoon, I'll put it there. And it will be available for you to watch over and over. Tom's a great speaker. If you want to, you know, check it out again, you're more than welcome to. Um, I encourage you guys, if you have newer beekeepers in your club, we have an entire series now of manufacturer webinars. They're all up on the YouTube channel for you guys to watch. Uh, if you have questions about products, check out the webinar first. If that doesn't answer your questions, reach out to me or reach out to manufacturers directly. I know they're all here to help. And at the end of the day, we all want healthier bees. And I think that's what we're working towards. And I, I really think we can achieve that at, at, at some point. So let's work towards that. If you have any questions, reach out to me. Tom gave his email earlier. Uh, T. Nolan at... Nope, nope. Or sorry, Tom N at... Nodglobal.com. Nodglobal.com. And with that, we're going to go ahead and shut down. Thank you again so much, Tom. And we'll talk to you guys down the road. Look forward to seeing you guys in the bee yard. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much, Tom.